Hello, and welcome to the York Festival of Ideas and what promises to be a fascinating and entertaining event in partnership with BBC History Magazine. My name is Pam Hartshorn, and Jessica Hart and Flora Harding and Pamela Bell, and sometimes when I like to throw my weight around, Dr. Pamela Hartshorn. I live in York, I'm an author, and I write trashy fiction. Although generally I prefer not to call it that, I prefer to refer to it as uh, popular genre, romance or women's fiction. I started writing 30 years ago in order to fund a PhD in medieval studies here in York. And since then I've written 80 books, 60 of them, 60 of them romances for Mills and Boone, which have sold over 15 million copies and been published in 25 languages around the world. I've also written historical fiction, sagas, faction, and non-fiction, all though aimed at the popular market. And the more I've written, the more interested I've become in how popular fiction works. Uh, so it's great for me to meet up with academics like Lydia Zeldenrust, who are looking at this kind of writing in a historical context and considering why it is that the books many women love to read have been routinely dismissed as trash since the Middle Ages. Although it hasn't stopped us reading them, I'm glad to say. And I have to say, I love the idea of romance readers as rebel women. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. Before I hand over to Lydia, a few technical notes for those of you who haven't watched uh, an event online before now. Uh, if you're watching live, you can ask questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And you can do that at any time it occurs to you. Um, uh, and I will sort of share them with Lydia at the end. If you've got any technical issues, like uh, if your Wi-Fi drops out, you can rejoin very easily by uh, using the original link and get, come back in that way. Today's event is being recorded though, so you can always um, have a look again at a later time. Uh, finally, and importantly, um, subtitles are available for this event. To turn these on or off, uh, you can use the CC Live button at the bottom of your screen. So it's with great pleasure now that I introduce Dr. Lydia Zeldenrust. Lydia's originally from the Netherlands. She did her PhD in London and is now a Leverhulme Early Career Fellow in the English Department at the University of York. Uh, she works on medieval romances and is particularly interested in their popularity across multiple different languages. Uh, she's going to talk to us for about 30 minutes or so, and then we thought that we might have a bit of a chat about the parallels between romance and trashy fiction uh, then and now. But I hope you'll have your own questions and uh, you'll be able to ask those at any time, as I mentioned, and I'll put those to Lydia on uh, your behalf. So without more ado, uh, please welcome Lydia with a virtual round of applause. And I'll say over to, over to you, uh, Lydia. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Pamela. I wonder what the virtual round of applause looks like. It's a deafening silence from this point of view. Uh, yes, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by explaining what a medieval romance is uh, and how the genre first emerged, because it's a little different from our modern sense of what a romance or a romance novel is. Um, and then I will trace how medieval romances still have an impact on film and fiction today um, and how they went from being uh, kind of the uh, height of sophistication to being branded as popular trash fiction. Um, right, so I will start with what is a romance? Um, so yes, what is it? What is a medieval romance? Well, it's not this. Um, I felt like I had to start with this um, and I apologise to Pamela for picking um, sort of the cheesiest examples um, that I could find, um, but this probably reflects what you're thinking of, um, sort of lusty ladies and men in tights. Uh, or indeed men in uh, chain mail or uh, uh, shirtless in, uh, in one case here. Uh, of course, there's no need for a shirt when you're a medieval knight because those arrows will bounce right off those abs. Um, yeah, this is not what I'm talking about. So um, forget this, although we will get back to it. But for now, let's have a look at, so what is a medieval romance? Well, we tend to associate the word romance with 
romantic. Um, so stories about falling in love. But as the genre first developed in the medieval period, this is not what romance meant. Uh, romans um, was a term used to describe works written on roman in the romance language as opposed to Latin. Um, so in other words, it was an indication of language rather than subject matter. Uh, romance simply meant book written in French, uh, in much the same way that in many modern European languages, uh, roman or roman uh, still means novel. Uh, the medieval romance is, after all, considered the forerunner of the modern novel. The roots of the genre lie in exchanges uh, along, in stories exchanged along the Mediterranean, and we also see links with Arabic, Persian, and Greek material. Uh, the earliest romances are also often set in a world that has the Mediterranean kind of as its centre. But the romance itself, as we kind of know it, uh, emerged most recognisably as a specific genre in 12th century France. Um, and the earliest works that call themselves romances emerged from a courtly context, uh, with poets writing for an aristocratic audience. So many were translations of cl classical texts, um, and they sort of mix history with legends. So I've given you a few examples at the bottom of the slide here. Um, we have the, uh, the Romance of Thebes, um, which uh, rewrites the Siege of Thebes. We've got the Roman de Neas, which adapts the Aeneid, and the Roman de Troyes, which is a retelling of the Trojan War. Um, and there's another popular one, uh, the Romance of Alexander, uh, which is also one of these early stories. Um, and it, this is, it's been noted, is a kind of early science fiction story. Um, as Alexander, once he has conquered the world, he decides that he wants to explore the heavens um, and the seas. And he uses a kind of nifty flying machine that you can see on the left here, where he harnesses together several griffins. Um, as well as a rudimentary diving bell, um, so that's on the right here, um, uh, to explore both what is above and what is below. Um, so you can see him here in one of the illustrated manuscripts, sort of um, looking at the fishies uh, around him. Um, these were works that were part of a move designed to elevate, elevate French as a literary language. So French was a relatively young and still emerging vernacular, um, and they were able to kind of borrow some literary prestige by using these high status Latin source texts. Um, so it's the idea that you translate high literary works in the hopes that some of the prestige of the original was sort of rubbed off. Now, the 12th century also saw the emergence of the Arthurian romance, uh, with Chrétien de Troyes uh, being a key figure in particular. Uh, he's the one who introduces Lancelot and the Grail into the Arthurian canon. Uh, poets elaborated on what they had read in Latin histories, and many tropes and key figures that we associate with um, the Arthurian legend come from this period, um, rather than from the earlier pseudo histories. Um, and supernatural elements in particular are added by romance authors, though it must be said that the historical records um, already feature dragons and a, and a shape-shifting Merlin. Um, so adventure and the imagination are kind of key elements of romances. Um, it's, what's also important for us um, to note is that romances emerge from a courtly context, and this is reflected in their contents. So our characters are knights and ladies, uh, it's the nobility, the story tends to start and end at court, uh, and the stories are also very concerned with uh, issues of inheritance, bloodlines, uh, codes of chivalry, etc. So it's very much this, this world of the nobility. Um, but the books themselves also reflect this courtly aristocratic milieu. So early romances are often found in lavish manuscripts. This is one example of them, the Talbot Shrewsbury book. Um, these are kind of richly decorated. They use expensive colors, lots of blues and purples, which were particularly expensive, um, and gold leaf. Uh, you can see that here too, although I wasn't able to make it as shiny as, as the thing is in real life. Um, these are objects to be treasured, and they're often given as gifts to forge political alliances, so these were true status objects. 
Now, romance is soon took medieval Europe by storm. Um, because France and England were culturally intertwined in this period, it did not take long for romances to come over to England. Um, the earliest romances that were written in a variety of French, um, known as Anglo-Norman, uh, and then later we also get romances in English. Um, this was after all the time when uh, English kings were kind of more French than English. Um, romances also cross borders into German speaking regions, into Dutch speaking regions, and from there they kind of conquered the rest of Europe. So we find them from Spain to Poland and from Italy to Denmark and Sweden, uh, and many were the bestsellers of their time. Uh, it's a very international genre, and this is also where my research sort of comes in. I, I sort of trace how these stories become uh, early European bestsellers uh, and what, uh, what, what sort of things appeal to people across cultures. Um, I'll give you one example of one of these. So this is um, Paris and Vienna. Um, this, uh, this is one of the stories that I work on and it was translated into loads of languages. You can um, see them here. Um, this is a story, coincidentally, if you ever were to read it, it's a story that teaches us that if you are a beautiful woman and you have to keep unwanted suitors at bay, the solution is to put some rotting chicken meat under your armpits um, and then soon all unwanted amorous attention will stop. I can guarantee you that. Um, I always say it's probably the first recorded use of a chastity chicken. So yes, Ooh, sorry, there we go. Um, so I told you then that love is not uh, 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 its hallmark at the start. Originally, it was about language, but gradually the genre uh, the genre of the romance becomes associated with the love plot, along with sort of ideas of adventures, quests, encounters with the supernatural. Um, love really becomes uh, a, an emblem of this genre. Now, whereas in other popular, uh, another popular medieval genre, the epic, uh, we see heroes kind of fighting or dying for a higher cause, um, let's say for their lord or for the greater good or for glory or fame. Um, if you've read Beowulf, um, you will know what I'm talking about for him. Um, glory and fame are kind of really important motivators. Um, with the romance, instead, we get a focus on the individual. So our hero's own success and fulfillment and love becomes the key motivator. Um, so a knight is measured by his inner feelings as well as by martial prowess. Um, so again, if you've read Beowulf, it's sort of action, action, plot, plot. Um, but in romances, we also start to see people's inner workings. What are their desires? What are they thinking, etc. Uh, and so it also results in lots of over the top scenes of kind of knights and ladies pining for each other. Um, though characters rarely swoon, it must be said. Uh, it really is only Lancelot who does some swooning for some reason. I don't know why, um, but it's mostly him. Now, one of the interesting aspects is that this love plot um, that emerged with medieval romances still has an impact on film and fiction today. So love as a driving force has never really gone away. Um, I mean, only try and think of a film or, or series that doesn't have the love plot. Uh, sometimes it's kind of shoehorned in. Um, even when the main hero is a kind of really horrible person, we know that he will uh, end up with, you know, the prettiest girl around who will get the beautiful woman uh, because those are the rules. Um, and these sort of scenes of people uh, spotting each other across uh, crowded rooms or um, battlefields or what have you, um, this kind of love at first sight is emblematic of the medieval romance. And so this genre, with its emphasis on feelings and your kind of inner desires, is also responsible for several other narratives that run deep in our culture and society today. So the first is and you will recognize them, I'm sure. Um, the first is the idea that there is only one person right for you, um, also known as the one or the soulmate or whatever other word you might use. Um, there's also the idea that this soulmate can complete you, uh, where love becomes a kind of uh, wish fulfillment. The soulmate is perfect. Uh, the lover brings you everything you could have ever wanted and kind of takes away all the pains. 
Um, and thirdly, the idea that marriage is a kind of ultimate achievement or an ultimate goal, um, as if we should all want this. Um, so romances typically end with a wedding. We don't really hear about what comes after, um, when the hormones fade, as it were, uh, whether they bicker over who does the dishes, he's always down the tavern. Um, it really is all about the falling in love and not the ever after as things must stay perfect. Um, and it probably won't surprise you to learn that a lot of the characters and plots from romances make their way into um, fairy, tales, fairy tales and folk tales later on. Um, and that, um, so it has an impact on later fiction, which then in turn has an impact uh, on uh, our own fiction and culture today. So yes, love is a kind of wish fulfillment. And I want to give you one example uh, of one of the texts. So this is, uh, uh, this is a kind of literal wish fulfillment, this one. So this is Marie de France's Your Neck, which is technically a lay, which is a kind of short romance. Um, this is the story of an unhappily married woman. Um, and this is how it opens. We're told that in Britain, there once lived a rich old man. Because his inheritance would be large, he took a wife in order to have children who would be his heirs. Um, how romantic I hear you say. Um, so this is not a marriage made for love. Um, she's kind of stuck in this unhappy marriage. And we see aristocratic concerns here about the kind of continuing of bloodlines, the passing on of lands and wealth. Um, he turns out to be a very jealous husband, of course. And so he locks her away in a tower. All the cliches are here. Um, and here she kind of, while she's in the tower, she laments the fate. Alas, she said, that ever I was born. Sorry, I can't do this normal because I feel like it has to be over the top. Um, my destiny is hard indeed. I'm a prisoner in this tower and only death will free me, she says. And then a little bit later on, she has a kind of long monologue. She says, I have often heard tell that in this country, one used to encounter adventures which relieve those afflicted by care. Knights discovered maidens to their liking, noble and fair, and ladies found handsome and courtly lovers, worthy and valiant men. If this can be and ever was, if it did happen to anyone, may almighty God grant me my wish. Um, so what she's saying here is, I've heard stories about knights and ladies kind of falling in love, this perfect love. In other words, she's read a few romances. Um, and if this is true, could it also happen to me? Well, as soon as she stops speaking, um, a uh, hawk flies into the tower um, and he sort of looks at her for a bit and then he turns into a handsome knight. And he says, I have loved you for a long time, this is the bottom of the slide, and desired you greatly in my heart. I never loved any woman but you, nor shall I ever love another. Um, there you go. So um, they've never met before, I must note. Um, this bird just sort of flies in and turns into a knight, and he also stares at her a bit, which is a little bit creepy. Um, but this is literal wish fulfillment in this story. She asks for a lover, and she gets one. This is the point where you and I might start going, and could I have a big bag of money to um, please? Uh, her wish totally came true. So it is the ultimate wish fulfillment. Now the historical context is important for this. I'm gonna sketch it in brief. It's a very long sort of story, but I'll give you the highlights. Um, the 12th century saw increased concerns over the inheritance of lands, titles, and properties. So primogeniture, uh, which means firstborn, uh, becomes a kind of key term for the laws of inheritance. And I'm saying it's firstborn, in practice it means firstborn son, of course. Um, now aristocratic marriages had long been made for political or economic gain. For the nobility, marriages were typically arranged by the family and deals were often made where the bride and groom were still very young. But there was a change. The church now insisted that marriage must be between consenting partners who loved each other. So this is a new development. It must at least look like the couple love each other. And this has an impact on romances. So they turn the transactional marriages of real life into perfect love stories. So characters kind of fall in love at first sight and the lover brings status, wealth, lands, and they kind of, 
titles, they solve all problems. Um, and I can't help but think that this has done some damage along the way. Um, I mean, is it very realistic to expect someone to kind of solve all your problems and, 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 and fix you somehow? Um, it's strange that we follow these guidelines still today, I think in modern dating practices, um, because these rules weren't even designed for us. Um, they have their roots in a centuries old feudal system, but there you go. But just to show you that not everyone in the medieval period drank the Kool-Aid, as it were, um, and that some authors also recognize that this idea of love um, is largely fictional, really, and idealized in romances. Here is an example from the Middle English Sir Tristram. Um, so this is a reworking of the Tristan and Isolde legend. Uh, these are kind of famous star-crossed lovers. Uh, Isolde is already married, uh, but the two fall madly in love uh, after drinking a love potion. Um, uh, so that's how the story usually goes. Uh, but in this version, the Middle English author has made a bit of a change. Um, what happens is that Tristan's dog, Hodine, um, also drinks the potion. So there are some lines on the screen here. You can see the Middle English on the left and modern translation on the right. Um, so we're told that uh, a dog was there next to them, and Hunde there was Visid. Um, so a dog was next to them, which was called Hodain. Uh, he licked the cup then as uh, Isolde's maid servant put it down. So just as they are kind of drinking the love potion, the dog also has a lick of that cup. Um, so the dog also falls in love in this story. Um, there's this play here on the idea that dogs are kind of famously loyal um, and he stays with them even as they have to flee and live in the forest. Um, and there are kind of moments where the dog gazes longingly um, at the two lovers because um, he's part of this love triangle. Um, so this story really pokes fun at the kind of common tropes, exposing that this is first and foremost a fictional kind of love. Um, so it shows the artifice of the idea of love at first sight in these stories, um, suggesting that perhaps it doesn't work as well in real life. Um, and it's been suggested that this emphasis on perfect love that we find in romances is why they appeal to the aristocracy um, who may well have been trapped in loveless marriages. Uh, and maybe it appealed to women in particular. So for men, it was far more acceptable to have lovers, to kind of find love outside of, outside of marriage, but women rarely had a way out. So in some ways, this might have been a kind of perfect wish fulfillment and escapism for them. Right, but I promised that I would be talking about trash, smut and guilty pleasures. Well, here we are. Um, so romances were already eagerly consumed um, by uh, sort of throughout the medieval period, but they really took off towards the end of the medieval period, becoming the earliest form of popular fiction. So I want to trace for you how it became kind of trash fiction, as it were. Um, there are some important changes here that are worth noting. So the 15th century saw an increase in the production, an increase in the production of manuscripts. So they were being made faster and also on a larger scale. The book trade was growing um, and the rise of print also made it possible to produce and distribute books on a larger scale, um, much larger than before. Um, we forget sometimes, I think, that printing was a medieval invention. Um, and it's worth noting that romances were among the first texts to be set to print and many kept being reprinted. Uh, printers were confident that these books would sell. This period also saw a rise in literacy and better access to education. So overall, more people were reading books. And as a result, romances were no longer associated with an exclusively aristocratic audience, um, uh, but it changed um, the audience. So in England, for instance, many owners of romances were the gentry, well-to-do merchants, um, the emerging middle classes, as it were. Uh, so readership was becoming more diverse. Um, but we can't really say at this time that everyone was reading romances as not everyone was able to read or could afford books. Um, and the idea of literacy is also quite fluid in this period. So what's also possible is that you could have heard a romance being um, recited or kind of read out loud. Uh, we think of that as a kind of literacy too, where you can't necessarily read the thing, but you still know the story because somebody else told you. Um, another important shift 
was that romances came to be associated with a female audience. Um, so though we know that many men read them too and owned them, increasingly women were being recognized as romances primary consumers. So it becomes associated with women as readers. Um, so I showed you um, this fancy manuscript or quite a few fancy manuscripts before, um, but um, it sort of changes the way they look when we come to early print. Um, very early printed books are still quite sizable and, and fancy and expensive. Um, they're relatively expensive, but as we move um, in the 16th century, these books start to become smaller and kind of more affordable, um, though I wouldn't necessarily call them cheap. Um, but they are kind of generally affordable, a bit smaller, you can sort of easily take them with you. Uh, we also get sizable print runs. So whereas some romances only survive like, in one manuscript, um, with, um, with early printed books, we sometimes get print runs of several hundreds, uh, especially on the continent. Um, we get quite high numbers um, for the time, it must be said, but several hundred uh, copies per print run. Um, and one of the things that's quite interesting is that many English printed romances survive only in fragments, um, which is often taken as a sign that they were so popular that they were literally read to shreds. Um, and also in this period, some elements that are now quite familiar to us sort of emerged first with um, the invention of print. Um, so one of these things is title pages. You can see a few here. Um, uh, this was um, relatively new, so uh, books at the time were sold without a cover, not with a binding, you had to get them bound separately. Um, and so the first page of the book had to kind of do all the selling. So this is something that emerged with print and kind of with bookshops, is that you had to have a kind of attractive cover, um, attractive title page. Um, and it's interesting, I think, to compare these covers to the ones that I showed you at the start, the kind of cheesy ones, um, to think about, okay, so how are they trying to um, entice a reader and kind of get them to be interested in these stories? Um, how do they draw you in? And as we might expect with any popular genre that is no longer for an elite minority, romances also eventually went on to spark a backlash. So in the 16th century, uh, romances were increasingly viewed as popular trash. Um, this is where we see that ideas of what is sort of high culture uh, and what is popular and therefore low status start to emerge. So humanists in particular were very concerned about romance's corrupting influence. Uh, romances often subvert social order. So there are lots of stories of cross-dressing, um, people transforming into animals or monsters. There's an interest in hybridity. So for instance, stories about werewolves and um, women with serpent's tails, they, they were quite popular. Um, so it's a, it's a very self-consciously fictional genre in which anything goes, um, including having a love triangle with a dog, as we um, saw a bit earlier. Now, famously, you will have seen the quotations here, um, in John Florio's translation of Michel de Montaigne's outcry against romances, they are labelled as wit-besotting trash. Um, the English scholar Roger Ashen warned that readers of romances, romances was a romance, uh, readers of romances would be led to manslaughter and bawdry. Um, Juan Louis Viver is another interesting uh, and very important commentator on romances, is quite influential. Um, he's a Spanish humanist who also worked in the Low Countries and um, he also worked for English nobility. Um, he famously labels romances as pernicious books filled with endless absurdities. Um, and he kind of complains about uh, scenes when knights com um, commit almost superhuman feats. Um, they, they always win and they always come back from the dead, even though you think by now they must really be dead. They always get up again. Um, and I can think of a few action films, I think, uh, or indeed Star Wars films um, that are quite similar. But um, what is even worse, Vives tells us, um, is that romances inflame beastly and filthy desire. Um, and um, he tells us that they deal with no other material than sex and war. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm sorry. Um, Vivest also gives a list um, of uh, particularly bad offenders. Um, and I can tell you that uh, Paris and Vienna, so the one 
with the chicken uh, under the armpit. Um, that one is on that list, a very, very pernicious book. I love it nonetheless. Now, I always find this really interesting because we can recognize some comments from our own time, I think, uh, about violence and sex and films and games. It seems like a kind of very familiar attack on popular culture. Um, I will say, um, I've read a lot of these and I always get the idea that humanists sort of miss the whole point of fiction and escapism and why you might want to read something that's just really entertaining, as it were. Um, so it turns out that snobbery about popular culture is timeless. Um, it matters, I think, that these are humanists um, who are now all about the kind of new classical learning coming in, and they're kind of looking down at these popular medieval romances, uh, which are no longer status objects, but which have become guilty pleasures. And there's absolutely a kind of class hierarchy going on here too, I think. Um, it's not just a story, it's who reads them. Now, Vives's books, oh, sorry, Vives's comments um, are found in a book called The Education of a Christian Woman. Um, this is a book he wrote while he was uh, a tutor to the future uh, Mary I of England, uh, and it's dedicated to her mother, Catherine of Aragon. Um, and so he is particularly concerned with romance's danger to women because he's writing about the education of women. Um, he says that a woman should avoid these books as she would a viper or a scorpion. And that um, if a woman was to uh, uh, refuse to stop reading them, um, they, these books should be wrested from her hands. Um, and he also kind of rails against the madness of husbands who allow their wives to read these books. What are they thinking? Um, and Vives, to be honest, is not the only one who's kind of concerned about romance's effect on women. Um, so centuries before controversies around the rise of the novel, uh, Madame Bovary, and also Jean-Jacques Rousseau's famous remark that women who read fiction are fallen girls, um, men were already writing about the corrupting influence of fiction. And it is no coincidence that cries against romances happen at a time when women were being recognized as their primary audience. And when the education of women, um, particularly young girls, um, was being debated. So that was going on at this time. Uh, and I should add, it was being debated mostly by men. Um, so what is often seen as a critique of popular culture is also the start of a long tradition of men snobbing women's literary tastes and policing their reading habits. So these comments, and there are loads more like it, I just thought these were particularly funny to share, but um, they often read as kind of thinly veiled worries over keeping women in their place um, and fears that women who sort of read about the wider world or who are educated will not be content to stay at home or raise children, um, which I think remain recognizable us, to us today. I mean, um, you know, never mention your degree on the first date, right? Um, and one cannot help but wonder, I think, whether this is about the idea that certain reading is dangerous to women or about a deeper fear that women who read are dangerous. Now, I am glad to say though, that despite this policing and lots of attempts to tell them what to do, there were plenty of women who didn't give a toss. So I'm going to devote the final part of my talk to these women, the rebel women in the title of my talk, as there were quite a few notable figures among them. Um, I'll start by saying that women had always played an important role as patrons of romances. Um, so figures like Eleanor of Aquitaine and her daughter Marie de Champagne, they were there in the early days and they played a key role um, uh, supporting poets at their courts. And the po these poets wouldn't have been able to um, uh, re uh, write these things if it wasn't for the very, uh, you know, if these ladies didn't give them money basically. Romances came to Sweden um, because of the patronage of Queen Euphemia, um, who had several French romances translated into Swedish, and she did this in honor of her daughter. Uh, and the first book printed in English, you may or may not know, uh, was in fact a romance. Um, and though history has emphasized the pioneering role of the men involved in this enterprise, as it is wont to do, um, most notably uh, William Caxton, 
it was, uh, this book was dedicated to Margaret of York, whose support was crucial to this pioneering endeavor. You can see her in the image here, uh, along with her pet monkey, um, who also makes it into this dedication portrait. Um, but um, when we look at evidence from wills, inventories of libraries, or the contents of palaces and houses and other archival evidence, uh, it tells us that there were lots of women who owned romances. So one I find particularly interesting is Alice de la Pole. Um, she was born Alice Chaucer. Um, she is in fact the granddaughter of the famous poet Geoffrey Chaucer, uh, and she owned a copy of uh, the romance uh, Quatre Fils et Mon, uh, or The Four Sons of Aemon. Um, this is the story of four young boys who kind of travel around on a magical horse, um, and it's, um, it's set in the time of Charlemagne. Alice's copy is in French, um, and there's every indication with her that this was seen as a sophisticated cosmopolitan text, so this is not pop to her. Um, we also have another example of a, uh, this is a translator, I wanted to share you, with you a woman who kind of translates romances, this is Eleanor of Scotland. Um, she translated Pontus de Sidon uh, from French to German. Now scholars have traditionally com commented that she must have done this for her husband because um, they can't really think of how else, why else she would have done this, um, kind of overlooking that she in fact comes from a very literary family. Um, she grew up at the Scottish court, her father is James I of Scotland, um, and there was a lively literary scene at the court at this time. Uh, her sister is a poet, and her father, her father, in fact, kind of uh, encouraged um, his daughter's uh, studies and their kind of love for books and literature. Um, so I think she may well have done this for herself. Um, she definitely loved these books. And we know that she owned romances too. Um, but it seems that scholars have found it difficult to kind of accept a woman's authority as a translator. For her husband, indeed. Um, now I've got a slide here with uh, just an overview of other women who owned romances. There are many more, but I just wanted to share a few with them because I think um, quite a lot of these are famous names. You might recognize some of them. Um, uh, these, uh, these women all owned romances. I must say that most of the women here own Arthurian romances. Um, these are particularly popular. Um, stories of Lancelot and Tristan um, are particular favorites. Um, they are all noble women, as you will see. Um, and this is largely because we tend to know more about noble women in their books because they, they often left detailed wills or they kind of put their codes of arms. Uh, in a manuscript, so we're, that's how we know who owned what, and we, we don't necessarily get that for women of, of, of other layers of society. Uh, but clearly these ladies were kind of eagerly consuming um, these uh, outrageous works. Um, we also have some more unexpected female readers. Um, so the Spanish nun, Saint Teresa, uh, writes in her autobiography that she loved reading romances as a child and would like, um, you know, not do her chores because she wanted to know how the book finished. Um, she also tells us that her mother loved reading romances and this is quite interesting because um, she tells us that um, uh, perhaps my mother read them that thus her thoughts might not dwell on the great troubles she endured. Um, so she really writes, and this kind of goes on, I've got a short quotation here, but um, she writes about the appeal of escapism and how romance sort of took away people's care. So um, St. Teresa's mother was caught in, uh, in a marriage that wasn't great, her husband maybe wasn't so ideal. Um, and so the moment in the day when she could read a romance offered her a moment to kind of escape the harsh realities of real life. Um, and she writes about how reading can sort of save your life. Um, it's also interesting, and I think worth noting, so I told you about Juan Luis Vives uh, and his kind of comments against pernicious books. Um, well, quite a few women connected to him, in fact, owned romances themselves or indeed commissioned them. Um, so um, he dedicates this work about um, the education of women to Catherine of Aragon, but we know that Catherine's mother, uh, Queen Isabel of Castile, owned lots of romances. Um, and there's some dedicated to her as well. Uh, Isabel was a kind of very formidable noble woman who had her daughters educated alongside her sons, uh, and she employed a female Latin tutor. 
Um, another woman connected to Vives is Margaret of Austria. She's also kind of part of this circle. Um, Margaret of Austria is the later governess of the Low Countries. And at one point she was uh, Catherine of Aragon's sister-in-law. And in fact, she teaches Catherine of Aragon um, French uh, in preparation for her coming to England uh, because they don't speak Spanish at court. So the solution is to teach her French. Um, Vives also works for Margaret at some point and he, uh, admires her greatly, he considers her a very formidable, intelligent ruler. Well, let me tell you, Margaret loved her a good romance. She owns a lot of them. Um, the one that I would like to highlight um, is a romance about her pet parrot. Um, so this is a really interesting one. Um, uh, and she has this sort of, um, this is made at her court. So the story goes, um, this is a parrot that she loved very much, uh, but um, the story is that while she was away to take part in political negotiations, um, one of the dogs at her court mauled the parrot and it died. Um, and her court poet then wrote a poem starring this pet parrot as a heroic knight uh, with Margaret as his lady. Um, uh, so the story in the romance is that um, the parrot uh, suffered such heartache while she was away from court that he kind of threw himself upon the dog's jaws in order to kind of end his misery. Um, so he died for love. Um, he becomes a very tragic romance hero in the story and he's given the title, The Green Lover, La Mont Vert. Um, and I think it's a great example because it kind of shows this vogue for romances is clearly a very popular genre and he, uh, women kind of kept happily reading and commissioning this smut. Um, so I think this examples like this really challenge the conventional idea of medieval women owning only religious books. They really love to read this too. Right, um, and this is my final slide. Um, it's interesting to think about, I think, how there might be a link um, with, between medieval romances and modern romance novels. Um, they are not quite the same beast, as I explained, but there are some interesting connections, um, not in the least that romance novels nowadays are looked down upon, they're kind of popular trash, right? Um, the sheer numbers of these things and the international popularity of these books. Again, there's lots of interesting links there, um, as well as the association with female readers. Um, and also, I would just ask you in general, why did we decide at some point that reading certain books should somehow make us feel bad? Um, so the next time you find yourself wondering whether you should hide some of your books at the back of your shelves uh, before joining Zoom, uh, remember that there is no shame in reading popular material and that you are in fact following an, a long tradition of refusing to be told what one can and cannot read. Romances were once the height of culture, they were prestigious books, and really, I would say, if it was good enough for St. Teresa, for Chaucer's granddaughter, or Queen Isabel of Castile, then why should you feel bad about reading popular smut? Thank you so much, Lydia. That was so interesting, and what beautiful, beautiful slides. Um... <laughs> I really, obviously, I found that fascinating. And uh, there were so many parallels, in fact, that we could really talk about for ages. But the one before I get to the sort of the questions that we've got lined up, um, of course, I'm particularly interested in the authorship of these uh, romances that you, you mentioned that they were sort of bestsellers, for instance, but who was writing them and were they getting any money for, for them? I mean, do we know anything about the people who wrote these? Were they men or were they women? Oh, it's a great question. Um, the interesting thing in this period is that around the time when romance was still kind of prestigious and they're written at court, we often know who writes them. Um, and it is predominantly men, not exclusively, but it's mostly men. Um, and they were being paid by their aristocratic patrons. So they would just be writing at court and they would be right. kind of working for them and they'd get some money for the kind of things that they do. I don't think it's a sort of, you know, how many copies do you sell and you get more? It was more, you write this one thing and you get um, patronage for that. Um, but as sort of, as we go on in the medieval period, um, it becomes very common for this to be an anonymous kind of text. So we do get the occasional author, and I will note that Geoffrey Chaucer also writes uh, a few romances. I think he enjoyed it, in fact, he was very good at it, and kind of also pokes fun at them a little bit in the Canterbury Tales, but there you go. Um, but he seems to enjoy writing them. 
but um, he's one of the exceptions. Most of the time we don't know. And if we do have a name, we don't know who the person is. So there's no historical record. So for some romances, there is a name connected to it. But, and yeah, people have wondered whether, whether this goes hand in hand with them losing their prestige and maybe people didn't want to put their name on it, but it's hard to say. There's an interesting parallel actually with um, romances today. Uh, uh, something like a Mills and Boone romance, which, and these are sold uh, very, very much by the, the type of story it is. So although there are some authors who will have a, a sort of a following, mostly uh, when they're published, you're looking at the, the, the picture and the title, uh, which tell you what, tell the reader what kind of story this is, you know, is this about a sort of, you know, a billionaire hero, or is it about a shake, or is it about something else? And actually the, um, the author's name is not that important for the reader, I don't think. Um, so I, I thought I could see that in the covers that you showed us about um, mm -hmm. when the early printed editions where they kind of, again, they're sort of telling you what's going on in the title. You know, will you like this kind of story? It's about these guys who are doing this, that and the other. Um, yeah. But actually it doesn't sort of say very much about sort of how it originated or where it's from. No, and it doesn't, it rarely gives the author's name, especially once we come to print, unless it's a very famous author, then yes, we might get it if it's a sort of prestige kind of thing, but otherwise they don't mention the authors at all. And like you say, there'll sometimes be like really long titles saying, oh, this is in the story and that, and you should read it because it's wonderful adventure, yeah. but, um, but there's no name. In fact, if we do get a name on the title page, it's often the printer rather than the author. Yes, indeed. Yeah, well, exactly. It's like Mills and Boone, isn't it? That's what you're yeah. buying. Not, you're not buying the author's work. Um, yeah. Now, we've got some uh, questions here. So let me just have a, a quick look through those. Um, there's one um, from JD saying, I was taught that the illuminated manuscript was decorated by monks as they contemplated the text. So who would have decorated the beautiful manuscripts you've shown? Um, the, the, would the monks have done it or nuns or um, do we know who, who actually produced the, the manuscripts? That's a great question because um, obviously, you know, I, I try to include as many lovely images because there are so many as I could, um, just to also give you a sense of, it's a great genre for kind of illustrations as well and kind of weird scenes that you can depict. Um, for the earliest romances, when they were written at court, they were also often illustrated at court, but you do get uh, romance manuscripts that are illuminated by monks uh, indeed um, they kind of um, what tends to go in the medieval period is that if you're looking for anything to do with kind of literacy reading writing illustrating it's either court or it's a religious institution because that's where reading and writing happens that's those are the people who are educated in this period um, and sometimes some of the romance authors are also um, chaplains or kind of religious figures who also write this on the side um, and we do know that some medieval uh, religious institutions had romances in their um, part of their library um, because of donations or because they bought them or made them. Um, but as the period goes on, so when I talked about that turning point in the 15th century when romance is kind of, or when books in general are produced at a, at a larger rate um, and a, a larger scale, you start to see kind of professionals or you, or you will get professional illuminators who are based somewhere. And I would say that the most of the beautiful images I showed you are not English. Um, English romance manuscripts are a bit there. They're not that fancy. Um, the really nice ones are from France or from the Low Countries. And in the 15th century in particular, the Low Countries, so kind of Burgundian Netherlands, they become the experts on um, illustrating romances. So they, um, you would go there sometimes. We do have books from other places where somebody maybe writes it in France, but you go to the Low Countries, to, to modern day Belgium to have it illustrated because they're the best. And these are professionals um, who get trained and who kind of do this. Um, so we do at the early stage, there might have been some monks, but um, for the, the, the really beautiful ones that I showed you, these are professional illustrators. Yes. Um, this is what they do. Um, yeah. uh, and there's another interesting question here. Are there any examples of tropes in medieval literature that have survived to the modern day and are shared a bit like the love triangle trope. Not, not with the dog, obviously. <laughs> Maybe, who knows? Uh, I love, I love yeah. the parrot story as well, that was great. <laughs> so yeah, the love triangle is one and it kind of, 
it, you can trace it back to um, Arthurian stuff. So it's um, Arthurland, so Guinevere, that is kind of the ultimate love triangle. And then Tristan and his old and King Mark is another one. Um, you get loads of these. Um, but yeah, you do start to see um, certain kind of little motifs and things that are um, that are reused. So there is in fact an official motif index and it will often kind of note medieval romances um, that then get reused in uh, fairy tales and things like that. So, um, well, the werewolf tropes, um, there are lots of romances that feature werewolves. That's one we still have. Um, the idea of somebody kind of transforming, um, but I will say in romances that always has to be resolved at the end. You can't have uh, a hybrid figure walking around that's strange. That ending must no. always be happy. Resolution, um, absolutely the point of a resolution. Resolution, absolutely. And, and, the, and the, just the thing that it ends with a wedding or it ends with a kind of happy marriage. Um, there's a lot of kind of tropes that we still see, but I will occasionally, like I watch, I mentioned Star Wars, it's a good one. I watched that very differently having read medieval romances because there's a kind of certain sense of, yeah, this is your bad guy, this is your good guy, this is how it must end and there must be a twist. And <laughs> there's a lot of that that you do see um, in these stories as well. That do I think continue. what's really interesting is um, maybe one of the reasons that these stories get looked down on quite so much is that, um, I mean, they're often described as sort of formulaic. But, but actually, that's the point. The point is that they are being a romance. And it's the same with a romance today. It's not trying to do anything else. It's not trying to tell you about life. It's not trying to tell, talk about marriage or the problems that might come after. It's, it's about sorting out the problems in a relationship and, uh, and resolving them somehow. So uh, I think the people who sort of complain about them being formulaic and that that's what makes them trash are actually sort of missing the point that, that, that the people who are writing these medieval romances, I'm sure, were not trying to do a sort of grand, you know, courtly. They were trying to write something that was really popular and they used the, the formula because the formula works. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it is, it's the key to it. It is a formulaic. And it's also why something like the dog is suddenly funny because if you know the formula, you know that that's a weird kind of deviation from it. Um, so yeah, the formula equality. There are some romances in the late medieval period that I kind of almost read like best of, like the greatest hits of all your best romance plots that we, like there's a dragon in it and here's, there's another monster yeah. and the night falls in a fountain or there's a fairy and a, the, the other world, like all the best hits are kind of, they make this kind of ultimate bestseller thing. Uh, which they is have to make it different from the one before. Uh, no, yeah. we've just got time. We better get through some more. Um, <laughs> do you think there was a reason for the shift between romance, romantic relationships being predominantly between two upper class noble lovers versus more modern romances that see a noticeable divide between the two lovers? So, for example, a prince mm. and a pre peasant or uh, vice versa and things. That's very interesting. I think mm. you're probably a better place mm. to respond to that one because they yeah the class difference seems to be essential doesn't it the kind of oh they should the star cross lovers they shouldn't be together but ooh, um yeah well certainly there's a there's a certainly in the modern ones there's um like really popular if you want one to sell you sort of make it about a royal like my my most popular book was called ordinary girl in a tiara it's like so that that's definitely a kind of a trope that 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 doesn't, I don't wonder where that did originate, which is the kind of, you know, the, there's the peasant, the ordinary person who, who gets to be a princess or something. And that's mm -hmm. a very sort of long standing uh, kind of, um, it's got a lot of appeal, that one, for a lot of people. I suppose it's a kind of escapist element in there, isn't it? Um, Ooh, I will say that this idea of, there is a whole genre of medieval romances that is about identities, finding out who you are. And it is, mm -hmm. they are often people who will, they'll live with like the local fishmonger or the local peasant and then they find out that their dad was a nobleman and that they were noble <laughs> all along so there is something that. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> um uh now uh do you know why were french authors such as chrétien de Troyes interested in arthurian legend especially given that arthur was welsh or uh, repeatedly and not related to the sort of french identity an interesting question do you know about that yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? And, and they do always emphasize that he is 
British, even though it becomes totally French kind of dominated in the 12th century in terms of the literary output, how many, how many texts there are about Arthur, um, but the, it, they're very clear that he is from Britain um, rather than Brittany. So, um, yeah, no, it's true. There is a kind of Celtic influence and in the Welsh, uh, but these are the sources that someone like Chrétien de Troyes is working with. Um, we also have uh, Was writing in this period. He writes the Roman de Brut, um, so the Brut story. Um, and, and their source material is, for instance, Geoffrey of Monmouth or um, kind of earlier uh, Latin sources. And we have quite a few Welsh authors writing about Arthur. So it's their source material. That's what they are using. But they are kind of, yeah, putting a little romance sauce on it, as it were, and kind of turning yeah. it into this whole new genre. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, Absolutely. And I'm just keeping an eye on the time, but what, but this is a good, a good one to end on, I think. But do you think there's a double standard in how men writing about domestic matters are treated by the literary establishment in contrast to chick lit by and for women? And um, and my answer to that is yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you um, want to feel free to take that one if you want to? Well, I, I mean, I think uh, no. I, I think it, it's a it's a question. I think. At the, t at the time, you know, there was also writing in the Middle Ages, wasn't there? There was that sort of sense of, you know, it, there's a difference if it's for women. I mean, why is it that women's tastes have been so routinely dismissed for so long? It's like, you're not, you're not allowed to just enjoy something for itself. There has to be some, some kind of worthiness before you're allowed to sort of enjoy it. And I think it's really sad. And I think what's really great is that, I mean, I love that rebel women thing that uh, sort of, you know, <laughs> Romance today sells in huge quantities, huge quantities around the world. And it doesn't matter, it's not advertised, it's routinely disparaged, whatever country you're in. And yet people are just going to read it anyway, because exactly as you said about, um, you know, uh, Isabel of Castile and, and that they don't give a toss really about what, what anyone's telling them. We're allowed to read what we want. and. Um, and this is why I love when you've got kind of the most vocal critic of romance. It's like, women shouldn't read this because yeah. who would might put ideas in their heads and they might, oh, they can't handle this sort of stuff. And, um, and they're so, you know, they're trashy. And you're like, all the important women around him are totally reading these things. <laughs> so, uh, it's like the Victorians. Um, he said there, there are all those uh, examples of Victorians putting um, wives in asylums for sort of reading novels. And it's like but there's something about not wanting women to be able to escape somehow or to, to conceive of another reality. And, and I think it's also, I mean, one thing you raised there with, we know that romance novels are very popular, right? And Mills and Boone sells really well, but the idea that you have to hide it and you see this to the kind of the public versus the private, what you might enjoy in private, you might not share. Um, Cause we, there is also um, a manuscript um, by Tudor women um, various Tudor women uh, sort of uh, associated with Henry VIII and his court. Um, and they, in public, will write, um, uh, translate stuff from Latin or write something in Latin or do or religious text. But there is one manuscript that a group of ladies shared and they're writing love poetry and kind of really silly riddles and things and writing about a man with really nice legs or things like that. But it was private. It was something that they wouldn't share there seems to be that thing of you can enjoy it on your own but you mustn't it's a kind of your personal folly that you mustn't share or something yeah <laughs> yes well it, and it's interesting that uh, with the the rise of the kindle has uh, meant huge sales for an increase in sales for romance novels as well um because people can read them on the train without anybody knowing yeah. what they're reading and the, it doesn't the train, look like you're reading one yeah <laughs> I, and I'm sometimes guilty of it myself, so I don't know if you can see behind me. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm upstairs. That's all my sort of trash fiction that I read and write. But oh, and downstairs in my sitting room, where people see it, that's where all of my book club books are. And I'm sometimes ashamed of myself for that. I sort of think, why don't I put why don't I put all my Mills and Boone down in the front room, and yeah. bring all the sort of the the Booker Prize winners up here and uh, shut them away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now it's, I, I think it's coming up for half past. I'm not sure if we've got time for another one. Are we going to be shut off? I can't remember if we're going to be shut off or if we're going to, <laughs> if we can carry on until we are. We are, thank you everyone. <laughs> I hope we well, have thank time. You. Thank no, you, no, it's up to, no, I must thank you. And also for the um, partnership of the um, uh, BBC History magazine. Um, but uh, if anyone's interested in watching this again or uh, referring it on, it will be, it has been recorded 
And uh, so you can watch it again. But in the meantime, thank you so much, Lydia. That was such an interesting and entertaining talk. It's been wonderful.